Brigitte, welcome to Open Circle. It's just so awesome to have you. I was so happy, so nervous and happy at the same time <laughs> to have you. I was listening to, to a, post, a podcast of yours uh, yesterday and I felt there's so much resonance and so much sameness, so much sisterhood almost with you, mm -hmm. with what I was reading about you and feeling into, you know, your background and how you are. It, it became even more clear why I just so personally love your being, love your presence. Absolutely. So I've, I've learned you're marrying the Western intellect and the Eastern spirit, which is just exactly what, what I'm so interested in. And I'm also really so resonant with the, the brilliant kind of scientific mind that I feel you're bringing and merging with, with spirituality. It's just <laughs> so much fun. And yeah, I'm super happy to have you and super happy to, to share my experience with you and share your being, share your shining, your brilliance with, uh, with our open circle community. I would love to just open with a very simple, but yet maybe not that simple question. How is it to be you? And how is it to be <laughs> you? I'm so glad with... you asked. <laughs> it's the only thing I know to answer. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, so sweet, Sarah. My whole body is getting tingly when you were speaking. Um, partly, so nice to hear good words. Um, um, there's like a ring of truth in what you said. I feel the same joy that we first met and sat in in being here together and it's such a gift it's a gift to me to be able to be met in this way it's the most fun so my body is still enjoying i feel my legs my belly and my heart just the delight of being with you and I'm also really present to just the ease and the clarity of our shared intention. It has to do with truth and love and service. Would you like to share just a few words about, about your work? Hmm. What is it that you happen to be doing with people and um, how did it come to it that you're doing what you're doing? Yeah. What is it that I happen to be doing is never really clear. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you have to define, define it fresh every time because it's just <laughs> undefinable. Um, so jokes apart, there is a truth in that, right? Because we don't know where we're going to find ourselves, where we're going to find ourselves, who we're going to find ourselves with. And if I really was truly honest, and it sounds the most tongue-in-cheek thing to say, is uh, I'm doing as little as possible and as much of what is necessary in the moment as I can and I have massive limits but I also have immense capacity like every being every moment of connection between us like it's a living process that's working through this living process how to say so the commitment is to integrity in the best of my capacity, not perfect, definitely not. But when we meet, something happens. And in the shared field of this field, field interaction, there is desire and longing and a history and a trajectory and a becoming and a being 
And there is a precision at this moment of interaction that's calling, that's asking to be, asking to be, actually. So I see myself as sometimes a mirror, sometimes a doula, sometimes a muse. There is no one way of encapsulating how one meets that emergent. So what it is I find myself doing is mostly sitting in the bathing in the beauty of who I'm with and really listening for how and where life wants us to go in service of something very simple and very <laughs> the no agenda the biggest agenda right in service of what in service of becoming who we came here to be simple simple and exquisite Simple and exquisite. And as we know, simple is not always easy. <laughs> but complex isn't always hard either. And as that simplicity is happening, I'm wondering, uh, what are people left with usually after being with you, after the, this, this simple being together takes place? Well, what, what what are they left with? That's a beautiful question. My clients are much better at answering that than I am. <laughs> <laughs> but what I can say, um, and you know this, right? We all know this in our experiences. When we have, when we find a resource, support, accurate reflection when we find uh, that we are met and seen and that we have a sense of um, belonging, right? There's this beautiful way that there's a healing that happens. And what is healing? It's just a return to my wholeness. So what, are, it's so silly, right? Like what do clients, what are clients left with? Well, they're left with more of themselves. <laughs> When I have access to more of who I am, I, um, sorry, I as the client, I, I know, I own my knowingness, I own my place in the world more. I sit, I rest more in my beauty. I rest more in my base. I feel that's deepened sense of, oh, there's a lot of good things happen. I, it's nice to put in words. <laughs> But then I can, I'm no longer fragmenting within and in the way that I show up, right? So there's a little more cohesiveness, coherence, resource, congruence, however you want to say. Somebody on one of my group calls yesterday was talking about how she she feels the wholeness that has been her birthright and she's known this, but now she feels it. Now she's living. Now it's not a question. And she said very cutely, she said, and I'm never going back. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a one-way street and I'm not going. I said, yeah, there's no going back, you know? What a wonderful commitment. I'm, I'm not going back. I would be curious if you have a sense of what may be unique about your specific approach, the way it moves through you. What's, what's the unique flavor of being with specifically you? Mm, great. <laughs> yeah, well, then. <laughs> Maybe I can answer that, but don't please, please go ahead. If there's anything. Um, I mean, there's so many things, right? Like everybody is a different being, and my my shape form my becoming in this life has definitely 
enriched by all the experiences that are unique to me. And some of the ones that, um, I mean, if you want to get really clear about it, I think something really precise I can point to is there's joy in my beingness. That it just is. And it will not be. I mean, I've I've suffered lots. I'm not planning on <laughs> that ending anytime soon. But there is always there. But there is always this very clear um, joy of being. And in the way that I teach and facilitate and like work with people, I have the good fortune of being able to feel through those places with that signature of joy holding the field for us both. That's really nice, right? And then there is the one who was born in India and raised in India. There's the one who has these roots in this culture and this foot in another culture and the one who's weaving. You know, my husband, a few weeks ago, he was like, you're not just weaving two cultures, you're weaving four. I said, how? He said, we, my husband's American, I am, you know, Indian, and we, for the first time in our marriage, recognized that um, it's a cultural difference that was creating friction. And we were like, oh. So it led to this beautiful series of epiphanies. We were like, oh, of course, I'm Indian, you are American, right? So there is this like very human social skin geography that informs how the juice flows through me. It's absolutely um, influenced by growing up in India, living in a culture and a land where, um, you know, there's been a, I don't know how to say, like great enlightened beings have walked that earth for eons and there is a repository as an accumulative repository of that wisdom that lives and breathes in the soil that I was born in. I came out of a spiritual vortex. I lived in the Himalayas. It was pregnant. I didn't know, but it knew. Mm -hmm. right? So those are some of the sh forces that absolutely shape um, how I see. And there's a freedom in that for those I work with, because the way it comes through me is very different from the culture, the paradigm that a lot of clients come from. Does that answer your question? It definitely does, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's actually, that's amazing resource to be from a different culture that's so, as you said, so rich, has such enlightening traditions and bring it to, to a different culture. Many people from the Western culture are trying to do that as well by going to India and learning there and then bringing a little bit, but this flows in your, in your veins. That's, that's yet a different, yet another expression. And I, I think I heard during your podcast probably that um, you've been asking these, these deep questions since you were born really, right? Is that, that been the case? Mm -hmm. First yeah. for science, right? With, with the physics. And yeah. And you know, more and more I realized that the questioning only began when I um, sort of distanced myself from my heart of devotion and it's very sad it's very sweet very natural <laughs> but um i remember being really little like before i was seven years old i lived in the mountains and all the things that i would read were you know little kid versions of the stories of great saints and, you know, watch the Ramayana and the Mahabharata. And like when we got a TV, we didn't always have a TV. It was a big deal to get a TV in our house and the neighborhood kids would come and we would all like get glued to the TV and watch the Ramayana and the Mahabharata, these old Indian epics that, you know, imagine a little room the size of this, like full of the... <laughs> <laughs> um, 
And in those days, I just really, I just knew, I just knew I to rest in, in that, those images of the divine. I just did. I wanted to be Krishna when I grew up, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> Has that been a common dream in between your friends in India? <laughs> Not really. <laughs> <laughs> Not so <laughs> but at some point, I mean, my mother was an atheist at that time. And her faith was really strong. I lived with her more than anyone else mm -hmm. uh, alone. And my dad had his deep devotion. And it was beyond words. He didn't need the temple. He didn't need anything. He would come out of the shower and like pray. That's his connection. And it was, and he is the one who would go on deep, you know, pilgrimage to this temple. He would walk. He would do all the things quietly. My mother, atheist. What is God? We've created God. It's a good dream. And little is she, I think at some point, realized that, um, it was not fashionable to believe in this thing or something like where I was like, oh, I need to question this. And I distanced myself from that. But before that, it was just clear. And then there was a lot of pain. And that pain led to a lot of questions like, what is this? Mm -hmm. How is this? Why are we, <laughs> you know, like, how do you explain? Yeah, okay. Like, where is the proof? Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> yes. But the mind is exactly. <laughs> integrated for later use yeah yeah we all ask those questions i imagine i know a lot of little kids still do yeah i guess many kids probably do and somehow they they forget and they don't always come back with the strength that you have come back with right always yeah that's true because i feel so clear you know everyone has a very different path they've come here to walk very different it's a very humbling realization when you're like oh sarah's on her own journey everybody is on their own journey and they're all perfectly fine where they are so the questions that were most tickling to me probably not so much not for my husband he doesn't care he's it's easy <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yeah. Yeah. I'm really glad it happened that you came back. <laughs> to Me <it>. too. <laughs> <laughs> now, there is something I do when I say, you know, from two questions ago, maybe, because um, it's not to be taken lightly. Um, moving to the West has been a huge gift to me. In my own learning and evolution, it is so gorgeous and it's so important. And I like now it makes sense why at 18 the call was so clear, you have to go. I didn't know why, but I have to move here and it makes so much sense. Like I've learned so much from being and living in the States, learning about Western mind, like going through these passages. Not just, you know, there's a shadow and a light to both East and West. And that's not lost on me. There's just something really gorgeous at the intersection that these polarities are trying to integrate. Now you must have studied the, the West much deeper than, than most people who just are born there. And who, for, for them, it's, it's almost transparent, right? All the Western social conditioning that you came into and that was different, <laughs> different. <laughs> so it was visible. So you could notice like what's going on here. Right? Yeah. It's so mm -hmm. funny. It's beautiful how you just, you put into words something that it took me years to find words for right then. Because wherever I go, I expect to find myself. So I wasn't really expecting, well, anything. And the learning through contrast is a very potent way of learning. And you start to, I started to notice more and more, you know, and only now actually in, I just turned 40, in my 40s. 
been a lot so much, okay, maybe in the last few years, um, especially being married to someone who was raised exclusively in the West, um, a New England family, these nuances, these cultural sort of lenses are both highlighted and like learning a lot from them. Yeah, and I bet then can also learn about the the lenses from where you came from in a sense that now they're visible as well because they may not be here. So they, they, they were something, something yeah. as well. Absolutely. Like to have distance. They say, you know, it's very beautifully said in probably every tradition in some way that like to know something, you need a little space from it. So it's been beautiful. I mean, I didn't really take my Indian roots seriously or I didn't think anything of it until I left. And then I go home and I touch the earth and it's like, oh my God. <laughs> Belonging becomes very clear in a visceral body, mm -hmm. human, earth way. You cannot explain, you cannot have, you know. Yeah, yeah. something we just cannot really jump over. That's an expression. <laughs> I love that. You can't, you really can't. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Also experiencing that coming back to Poland, where I'm originally from, after years of being in different places. That's just, can't cheat this part. That's my body is from here. That's all. I feel so happy. My whole body lights up hearing that. It's so true. You know, it's the resonance of that deep truth, recognition. Yeah, there's no friction here. Not, not this kind of friction, somehow energetically and physically. Just like a, a tree that's trying to you know, grow somewhere else outside of its climate. It's not going to. So beautiful. There's like a knowingness in your bones and your cells and the land knows you. Yeah, it's so sweet. And coming back to the West, to the integration of the, the Eastern and the Western, you have some some amazing experience working with leaders of, of in big companies, right? You, you mentioned Google, MIT, Harvard. Also, um, <laughs> that just happens to be in the field of my interest very much. And I'm, I'm just wondering if there is a few words you could share about that experience. Well, there's a real deep pain that we haven't really acknowledged in our culture. Um, do you know Amma, the hugging saint? I do. I just watched this beautiful movie about her life. It's on everybody's list now. It should be called Amma's Way. And they were saying something that really struck home. Um, she said at the United Nations or something she was addressing, and she said, uh, there's two kinds of poverty in the world. There's the physical, material, you know, poverty, where we don't have access to water, air, clean clothes, shelter. And then there is the emotional poverty, where we don't have, we don't feel care and love. And then she said, what really struck me, it made me cry. She said, and when you take care of the second, you take care of the first. Mm -hmm. Starting within, right? Starting with your self, with your human self. Maybe indirectly what I'm trying to say is the opportunity, one of the reasons I love working with leaders who, who hold more than I can hold in my care is because when that system finds the wellspring to drink from, to be full of love with. You know, you work at Google, you work at MIT, you work at Harvard, you've got, you've got your intellect working really well. That's, that's not a question, right? So we have, we have this beautiful, incredible, exquisite intelligence, exquisite 
intellectual brilliance. Oh, I love it. And when it's supported by the grace of the heart and when it's supported by the grace of an open belly, like when it's connected to the fountain of abundance, not just material, but emotional, spiritual, energetic, like when that expands and blossoms, it fountains, it fountains in ways that I can't imagine I would never be as creative as these beings in nourishing so much more. And it's gorgeous. It's so gorgeous because obviously it starts with us. And then when we are full, it can flow through. Oh, this is so beautifully, beautifully said. Yeah, may it be so in all the all the places, all the structures that the fountain, that the well is there as well, accompanying the brilliance of Intellect. That's so so much of my intention as well, and I just love how you express. Yeah, um, yeah. There's like a way of serving from pain, which we all know. <laughs> <laughs> I should because I have. Well, I don't have white privilege directly, but I do. Sort of, I'm married to it. <laughs> <laughs> I have a lot of other kinds of privilege. <laughs> I have a lot of privilege in my life. Um, but there is the serving from that contraction, from that like should, for like obligation not grounded in love. And then there is service that just must be so. The irresistible <laughs> flow of love that just must be so. And how the structures can look created from that. That's such a, that, that's very much, that interests me so much. How then all the systems and structures can, can look and function being so informed by this. And so how I know it's possible. I know it can be. And I'm really glad we're with that intention. <laughs> me too. It's so, a Tension of my life in a way and it is I mean there's so many amazing beings who have lived this intention who have created magnificent structures to serve because there was love in action I mean just watch that movie on Amman she's just one example of how she makes decisions love when love goes out to make decisions it doesn't say well this is what the budget is and da, 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 da. it says where's the need and how can I serve it? Yeah. Right? And there are so many gorgeous beings who are living this question at different scales. And, you know, my life is just one small iteration of that. One of the expressions or one of the, I guess, expressions of, of what helps build that world. And that would definitely be, in my view, coherence that you, you mentioned in, in your write-ups and that will be the, the theme of our upcoming meetings. And I was really, really curious to ask you, uh, just what is coherence in, in this context? What, what is it? There's so many ways to answer that question. Um, and I'm just going to say it's joy. For me, it's joy. It's the place of joy. And we all know it. We know when we're... When there isn't friction. We know when there is no friction, when we're not creating that friction. And it doesn't mean life is doing what we want. Often my want has nothing to do with it, but it's that place in me where it's that knowingness, it's that felt sense of resonance of being in harmony within, between, and all around. 
to me. That's just one way to look at it in the way, in the context that I'm speaking to, right? If you look at coherent fields and physics, it's a certain thing. And what it means is that there is, there is a harmonious flow. There's, it's not in competition, it's not in opposition to something else. So nature is a coherent field. By the way, we could say we're just doing very little, just like you said in the beginning, what, what are you doing with, uh, with clients? Just not doing very much in a way, doing just the, the flow happens and there is very little or no movements that would disturb the flow, let's say, from just being the the easiest, most joyful, the, the most um, effortless flow of happenings that, that can be, that's, that's my feeling of coherence. And it was beautiful to, to feel into the, the text as I was being with them, because I, because it was experiential, just okay, what is coherence? Okay, let's, let's be in it, <laughs> let's be in it. And that's just so nourishing, so, so supportive for everything. It's just there is no agenda, in it, right? There is just no personal agenda, I would say, no, no twisted agenda in any way. Yeah, it's a, it's a beautiful thing you're naming right now. Because I want to be clear, this is a very important thing to feel like, when I am the coherent flow of life, I'm not outside of it, right? I am life, living life, life meeting life. How does life want to meet life? Well, apparently right now through this here now, like this, right? And there is, there is an I, there is an Ishita here. There's the point of Refraction, as we say. So I I show up. I have to show up. If I don't show up, life can't be received. So in a way, maybe coherence is a function of receptivity for which we need a receiver. Something that is, wants to come through, and then there is the receiver that is is there to to allow it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The 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 beauty of this coherent field, right? Like of the nesting dolls of what we call coherent fields, is um, I can lose myself in a way, and when I lose myself. I find myself. It's you know one of those. Things. It sounds like oh, it's just a nice thing to say, <laughs> but it's very true in our experience. We all know the state of flow, but how is it working? What makes me more? Um, what brings me in? What takes me out? That's sort of what I'm looking for. Because the more I know that, the more I can stand under than knowing the more i can tune my tuning fork have a little more agency wow so there is a, a choice actually in a sense something is making that the choice i was wondering what's what, what's the way to coherence and i'm hearing that part of it is recognizing what, what brings me out of it and what clicks me into it let's say um, what what's the way to coherence? Oh, well, you're gonna find out. <laughs> <laughs> Funny thing about teaching in this way is, um, your direct experience is more important than anything I can say. It must be so. So we are gonna find out, like, what is happening there. What for my nervous system, my experience. What's my path back to presence? How do I know when I'm in it? 
How do I know when I'm not? Good questions. We can start looking now. <laughs> I'm very happy to. <laughs> it's really fruitful practice, I will say. <laughs> it's fun. It, it, it's good. It delivers good results. <laughs> good. <laughs> and let's say it another way. I mean, Gandhi said really sweetly, probably not in these precise words, but he said, happiness is when what I'm thinking, what I'm feeling, and what I'm doing, what I'm saying are the same. So there's a congruence in the energy and the word, in the movement and the word, and the instance. I'm not like feeling one thing and saying another. What a relief. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. It feels like just one movement. There is no, no se separation, no, yeah, no distance between. It, it, there is just movement. Thomas Hubel said some this beautiful quote. He was describing what um, moving from stillness, like, you know, mm -hmm. acting from, because it's not like, now I'm still and I'm not doing anything. Well, I could be doing everything, but where the movement is sourced from, I'm at rest, complete rest. And he said, and then you sit in the temple as the temple. And when you sit in the temple as the, as the temple, it's all the big symphony of creation. Like there's just music in creation. And here we are, right? Like, there's, you said there's no separation. There's no separation. But then I'm here. I'm life in life. I'm life as life. I'm dancing through life as life. Dancing in the temple as a temple. That's joy. <laughs> <laughs> joy in motion. <laughs> Exquisite image. I'm not totally feeling. Maybe not totally, but I'm feeling into it very much. And it's you know, very easy to get uh, attached to the state of coherence, the state <laughs> of flow, <laughs> which is attachment, you know, can come and go, it's fine, and then it's like, oh, where did it go? How did it go? Mm -hmm. Yeah, as long as the going and coming isn't a problem, it's okay. Yeah, it's only a problem if I believe it's a problem, and it's actually not even then a problem. So. <laughs> Easy, easy. To share, share a little bit about your own journey with coherence. As, <laughs> how has that been evolving? Is it still evolving? I don't have a lot of skill in being out of my inner harmonic. If I'm not in right relation with myself, it's like bees are stinging me all over my body. It's always been this way. Not to say that I'm like some pure soul who's never cheated, lied, or you know, done all kinds of things, but I've learned so much from doing that. I've learned so much. It was so clear. I was five years old and um, I was at home, sick from school. <laughs> Off day, my mom was at work and we used to live in this little town in India, yeah, where like, you know, the highlight of the kid's day was this guy who would come through in his dirty clothes with his long fingernails and like one long pole with candy wrapped around it. It was just like gleaming. You could just tell that there was tons of artificial coloring in this candy. <laughs> it was not healthy and I was forbidden from eating it. My mom was like, you could not have that candy. I will not get you a peacock. I will not get you a tiger. The guy, he would take his <laughs> candy and he would mold it into whatever shape you wanted. It was amazing. It was like sculpture. It was art. It was like, and a treat. <laughs> so much excitement. And um, I was home alone. I had a piggy bank. It had coins in it. I knew this was a no-go. Cannot do it. Should not do it. She had been very clear. It's going to make your stomach bad. Don't eat it. And home and the bell rang and the guy was coming through the street and I was like oh my god I'm going to go and get some candy so I broke my piggy bank got my 
coin, ran down the street, you know, homesick, bad stomach, still running towards the caddy that's going to make it worse. Get the guy, like he pulls this rope of candy in his dirty hands and he like he's like, what do you want? I say, I want a peacock. So he makes this like shimmering peacock of like mm, yummy taffy like candy and I'm holding it in my hands and it's like, oh. And I was like, this is my moment. And I had a lick, you know, just like one lick. And I felt so guilty. I felt it was so wrong. I couldn't do it. I couldn't eat the peacock. I mean, that was like, that's that's me in a nutshell, you know? And then I dropped the peacock on the street, ran home, and I didn't tell my mother about it till I was in my 20s. And she was like, why didn't you eat the peacock? <laughs> It's because I would have known that I did something that I was not supposed to do, right? Like, and that story is illustrative of many things. I mean, part of it is neurosis. I could loosen up a little. You know, I could just be okay with, like, there's a shadow of that kind of conscience. And I'm still working through it. I'm still trying to, like, loosen it up, like, you know, hold it lightly. But it's also, it's like, yeah, if it's not, if I'm not clear in myself, I don't like it. I don't like who I am. And the most important thing to me is liking who I am. That's my mm -hmm. path. And everywhere I'm tested in it, every small things, you know, said something to someone, didn't follow through, that's going to hurt. I'm going to take care of it. That's That was the process of inquiry that opened up a world um, that led me to be sitting here with some degree of authority to be able to hold this kind of space for people because it's all about internal self-honesty how am i being why what is makes me do this this way and not from like yeah i have to say there's like this lens of i'm bad and like not good enough that i find prevalent in the west i didn't have that it's just very clear, like, what is, why is it this way? And I had my share of other kinds of trauma. Mm -hmm. I think I'm bad for doing certain other things, but not like this, you know? So there's a degree of secure attachment that I think just being born in India gave me, even though there was lots of tumult. But yeah, that's the path to coherence is self-honesty and being able to like look and really receive what's there whether you like it or you don't like it or you want it or you don't want it it doesn't matter like it's like where's what's the truth of this here now it sounds like there's a very clear feedback from life just okay that's i, I feel bad about it it's like it's just not possible to continue i mean i would have to push the feedback away very using a lot of energy to do that to then continue eating the peacock or <laughs> whatever yeah, it is. I don't have that energy. <laughs> yeah. yeah. When I've had to, like when I've had to like push it down and go through, oh my God, it takes a long time. And so it's like, you know what? That's just not worth it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, um, yeah, I love how life just, it just really shows us the way. Somehow it, it really just, it, so clear when we just open to look and not just be very fixated on the on the result. Oops. It's so true. It's baked in. School of life, best teacher ever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, life is the school of life. Makes <laughs> 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 no sense. Yes, we're gonna make. I love that. <laughs> 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 the new title, Life is a School of Life. Life is a School of Life. <laughs> Maybe our next series can be Life is a School of Life. I mean, it is. <laughs> it's funny. It's funny and it's so true. Like, um, if we stop looking, when I stop looking for my life to be um, a certain way, anything other than just a grand, beautiful playground of learning, I created more um, 
suffering that I need. Yeah. When I remember, then it, it's not always, you know, easy, but there's a big, deep relaxation that happens in me. I'm like, yeah, yeah, I'm in the school of life. The lesson's going to continue. Lifetime. Yeah. Oh, I think it's going too slow. Okay, well, I'm here walking forever. What's the hurry? You know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, beautiful. Life is the school of life. And also, I was wondering about presencing. So I, I love how you use the word presence as a verb. Presencing, presencing, embodying our divinity and humanity, or actually presencing, presence as a process of arriving right into here, into life. And I was really curious how does presencing relate to coherence? Because actually, they they must be married, mm-hmm. or even more than very yeah yeah beautiful you know one of the funny things about teaching and uh, speaking and all of these things is it's all the same thing we're all going it doesn't matter what i call it you call it the heart of devotion call it presencing call it anything we're where we're coming to is the same thing so they're not just married you're right um but they can be seen as, you know, different facets of a diamond. The same diamond, you're just pointing to this one little facet of the same rock. Mm. Uh, it's con- continuously being polished. I feel like coherence is a result in a way of presencing. It's, it's more than a result, but somehow there's presencing and coherence c- can be the case in this. Yeah. That's beautifully seen, Sarah, really beautifully seen. Um, and I'll tell you my intention in doing this it this way. It's hard. Language doesn't afford us this luxury often, but it's easy to think of this as a thing that is static and fixed in, in some way. When we look at it, through our Newtonian understanding of the world. Right? It's the same way that we've been taught to think of ourselves as, I don't know how to say it, maybe things. I am a this, and I am this many years old, and I have a mother and a father and a husband and a house and a you know, I'm a thing, but I'm a, I'm not a thing. There's no things, no things. So you go to, you switch your lens from Newtonian to quantum and there's no thing. And there's no things, even in physics. That's incredible. We know this. We know this with our, like all of our brilliance. We, we now understand that what the mystics have said for eons they were literal. The, these texts were not just, you know, some esoteric thing. They were very literal, very precise. No things. So presencing, ishitaing, saraying, that's more accurate. Coherent seeing. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's like come to center. The name of my practice is come to center. Now you... You think center is a place. It's not a place. I was standing in one leg in yoga yesterday and I was delighting in how like balance is it's continual attention and intention and movement to be in balance. Right? It's the same process. So that's why it's a presencing process. It's a living, breathing becoming that we're we're just catching a small sliver of that trajectory of our life together we get to walk maybe we get to walk for three hours together maybe we get to walk for six months with someone maybe we will get to walk with two years but in the process of that living becoming iteration we get to look that's all that's happening I love that absolutely love the the ink the, the ink part to everything because everything <laughs> <laughs> it keeps you on your toes right if I could meet you and say uh, 
Sarah Ng. <laughs> Sarah Ng. And you kind of did. You said, how is it to be you right now? In the beginning, you said, what is it like? And it's like, what's Ishita Ng like? <laughs> yeah. We will have a series of events around coherence and also a longer event around presence. And I'm, I'm wondering if there is anything you would like to say to someone who's considering joining, what could they expect? Uh, why would they, what, why would it be good for them to join if, if they feel like it resonates with them? I guess the resonance is the only reason to join. <laughs> I would agree. Resonance? <laughs> then, come. then we can have some fun. Um, there's no other reason to really come. And that's really important to honor in yourself. Um, that's my invitation to you, to really listen. And if there's a tickle, I, I always say, you know, it's nice to follow resonance. So that would be the invitation. And what we're going to do, well, let's see. It'll be a function of who shows up. And it'll be a function of what your intentions are. So I'm going to ask um, each person coming in, and Sarah will coordinate this, is what, what they're showing up for, what they're wanting right, together. And then we'll leave it to the field, and we'll see what feels real and relevant. And um, my vision for the, our time together is for us to really examine the nature of flow in ourselves, in our lived experience and our shared experience. So they'll, it's just a slow, slowing down together. So I used to run this delicious thing called slow space, and it's kind of like slow space. We're going to be in slow space. So we can digest and examine with some spaciousness, with some resource, the nature of how we are. So if that excites you, it's a good thing to come check out and play in. And I also want to say... Um, a lot of being together is really helping the subtle become explicit. Because there's a lot of things happening in the hidden dynamics behind the visible that really shape the visible. And so the hope is not to just come look, but also to like walk out with a different degree of awareness with possibly a perspective that's expanded and enhanced by your own investigation. And I'm going to try to keep it simple. <laughs> so I don't often do a lot of work that is just information. And I rarely do that. But we're going to balance some information, some experience, and some share so that we can learn together with each other from each other sounds so wonderful i, I can't wait <laughs> i just want to be <laughs> so bad <laughs> so please if you're considering joining sign up early so i have a little bit of space to feel into who you are and what you want and uh, show up in service of that uh, yeah it feels like we're all showing up somehow in service for each other, but by being there transparently and by being there in honesty, we're just creating this field together that's willing to be in this way. That That's amazing. Come join us, if it resonates, <laughs> only if it does. Mm -hmm. Then we can have some fun. It's been lovely, lovely having you, and I'm so glad that you're here and that I get to show your shining to, <laughs> to everyone. <laughs> And uh, yeah, is there any any last words you would love to, to share with, with our audience? Yeah, so if you're listening to us now, you're asking big questions or you wouldn't be here. And I just want to honor that asking. I want to honor that looking.
Yeah, I can I can say I um, cherish that. And I have been softened and humbled and blessed. And I trust that whether you come, you don't come, just start looking. It's a blessing, it's a blessing to us all. <laughs> just yes. It's a vested interest of mine. I like to know, I like to meet, I like to be with and play with and explore with those who are in the questions, living the questions. Yeah, so that would be fun. Wonderful. I, I love that as well. <laughs> I just, just love that as well. But it's been awesome to have you. Thank you so much. And uh, until pretty soon, actually. My pleasure. Thank you for making this space and holding it so beautifully, Sarah. So.